Good morning. Welcome. What's the transfiguration of Jesus all about? Let's read it today in Mark chapter 9, the first eight verses. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one any more, but only Jesus with themselves. Now the first chapters of Mark have been about who is Jesus. And then we have this commitment, this confession of faith that he is the Messiah. And then we have the last chapters of the Gospel of Mark. And now we're moving into that last half. And those show Jesus moving towards his crucifixion on Golgotha. Now we come to this place and we come to this transfiguration. Jesus takes his disciples up on a mountain and they finally see Jesus transfigured, bright and shining. And then he's talking with Moses and Elijah. And you know, that's very interesting because Moses would represent those who die but are resurrected and are in the kingdom. And Elijah, of course, was one who was translated. He never died. He went straight to heaven. And so he would represent those of us who are alive at the end of time who will not die but will be translated and will go to meet him in, in heaven. So both classes of people are indicated here talking with Jesus about his death and his resurrection and the conclusion and victory of the, of the mighty gospel. And then we have Peter who never knows what to say, but he always makes sure to say something. Peter probably could have just held on a little bit longer. There's kind of a parallel here between the baptism of Jesus and now we see Jesus, now that he's told them he's going to suffer and die on the cross. And now a voice comes from heaven again telling us that this is Messiah. And then at the end, of course, they look around and they don't see anybody, only Jesus. And although Peter suggested, let's build three tabernacles here, really it should have been about Jesus. So there are some very hard days ahead of rejection and violence and murder. Jesus has a couple of purposes. One of his purposes is to prepare his own heart to go to the cross, all the way to the cross, and not to flinch. Another piece there is that the disciples don't really know what's coming. They have really only just begun to get an inkling of what's coming up. So Jesus is going to pray for them. He's right here. He's hoping to give them something that when they're under great duress, they'll remember this supernatural event that, that they were there, that they saw it. And so I think Jesus wants to give them this, this glorious revelation of himself in glory. Now, God leaves us markers in our experience. There are times when God intervenes in our life, and those are very important just because, just like what he's trying to do here, he's trying to give something to latch on to when for a time of crisis they can remember, well, we were with Jesus in the mount. And so God gives us times in our life. Sometimes they're supernatural. Sometimes they're truly, unambiguously miraculous. Other times they're kind of quiet. Remember John the Baptist, one of the greatest prophets of all, and yet he never did a single miracle. And so many times God does things in our life, which we wouldn't really categorize as a miracle, but we know that divine providence has been functioning, that God intervened in my life. And that's an important thing for us. So we want to lay hold on those, whether it's more supernatural or more just an, an awareness that God has been at work in my life. We want to remember those things and fasten those things down in our memory. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, you are a good God. You are not indifferent or neutral or preoccupied somewhere else in the universe. You have a great interest in each of our lives. Lord, help us to hang in memories hall these times when we saw you in glory or when we saw you do something mighty and providential in our life. Maybe nobody else recognizes it or nobody else saw it and nobody else understands it. But as we understand it, Lord, help us to remember those things because there will be times, times are coming, and we will need those strong pieces for the crisis at hand. Bless us with that, we ask in Jesus' name. So God be with you and watch over you and hang in memories hall some of these things.